And welcome back, everybody, to another edition of Around the Bases with Bubba and Mo, episode 25. I am Bubba. You can find me on Twitter at BDNTrick. As always, my co-host Mo on Twitter at Boston underscore Mo. How are we doing tonight? We're doing well, Bubba. What's going on? Not much, not much. Just another week through the MLB season, pretty much. But a lot going on, as always. It never seems to be a dull moment these days. Um, so let's get right at it. You were hinting at this last week, and now we get to uh, actually talk about it. A potential trade of the Tigers sending Michael Fulmer, a guy we've talked about in the past, not really wanting to be traded. He's worth you know cheap for a while. Um, going to the Braves, who are rebuilding. What are your thoughts on that? I saw this while doing some research, and apparently I got to go to the SB Nation pages a little bit more to see some of these uh, – articles that they kind of bring up and, and throw out some wacky ideas now um, the, the idea to trade Fulmer isn't crazy I mean yeah he's he's having a nice season he's had some elbow issues lately so you know last three or four starts he's had five earned runs it's been interesting to see I know Eno Saris wrote a, a page on him that you know his change up he can he can get swing and miss with his change up where he, and he also can get it with his slider too K percentage is slightly down this year and I thought it was interesting when I looked at Brooks in July, his batting average against for his fastball and changeup is like a, like changeup's 360, fastball's over 300. So he's, he, his changeup, he's not, I don't think he's locating it very well um, lately. That could be the elbow issue. But <laughs> this guy on SB Nation, you know, trading Fulmer, and he said, you know, the, the, I would ask for Acuna right away. I would ask for Acuna, start with him, then you go get maybe – a couple other prospects, maybe Albies with them. I mean, why don't, why don't the Braves go trade their top five for Michael Fulmer and just, there you go, they're in the World Series. It, it was crazy. And if you looked at the comments, I think there were like a, like 170 comments. People were like, are you crazy? Like the Braves aren't trading Acuna for him straight up. They're just not doing it. You know, I like Fulmer, and I think Eno did a great job in, in his article recently to kind of say he could be a top 10 pitcher could be a top 40 pitcher. We don't really know right now in terms of fantasy because, you know, like I said, his K percentage is down. But I thought it was just crazy to see – not crazy, again, that they might trade him to spark the rebuild a little bit, but crazy of the prospects they think they can get for him. I know he's controllable. It's only his second season, full season. But it, I thought it was just kind of crazy to me to, to think that they were going to get, like, the Braves – top three prospects and then maybe another low a guy uh i don't know what your thoughts on it are baba yeah um it's kind of like how i feel with the the astros like i don't want them trading tucker i don't want the braves trading Acuna for anything when you have a kid that's 19 years old and just tearing through the system like we talked about you need to get like one of the best players in baseball at least much better than fulmer Fulmer, not to discredit him at all. He's young. He's controllable. All those good things, but you know, I don't. I don't trust pitchers a ton because they seem to be getting hurt way too often lately. Um, and the other, the other major factor to me is I'm just not a big Fulmer guy. Like he's a good pitcher. He might be a good two or three. I just don't see him being an ace. I could be totally wrong. He's shown good stuff, but like Verlander had his days where he was an ace. Fulmer hasn't shown me that. Maybe he'll develop into that. He doesn't have the velocity and that kind of stuff that leads me to believe he will. But you never know. Maybe he goes the Greg Maddox route and figures it out. But as a whole, yeah, I, I can't understand giving up the farm. Like it, it, It's a luxury to have. It's something we've seen other teams do when you have all these prospects and you're rebuilding. You can kind of make some moves and make it work. I just don't think this is a move for the Braves, who are set up really nicely right now to have something going good, potentially starting next year, definitely a couple years down the road. So I, I don't see the point of this one at all. Yeah, and just to kind of end this a little bit, I thought Dombrowski, although I think Davey Deals, you know, has some tr has had some trouble here making deals that weren't for Craig Kimball or Chris Sale, which those are auto deals that you and I could make. He did get, do a great job in that year where they were down in 2015 selling Cespedes, who was basically a rental, even though he stayed with the Mets, for a Michael Fulmer, and, and Luis Cesa was in there too. But to get a Michael Fulmer as a rental, and we all know the rental prices now are way down. You know, Hugh Darvish was the exception there. They got Calhoun. But 
I thought it was a great job by him in that sense. Um, you know, to the next one, you kind of brought this up too, and I think we all knew it happened. Um, the, the Rockies offered a preseason extension to Cargo, a four-year deal. You have to wonder sort of what the – was it could have been 25 a year. I'm not really sure. They didn't come out with the, the, the monetary value of it. But I thought it was interesting that they did offer him something. You know, he is only 31 years old. He had 40 home runs in 2015. But what, what did you think about, uh, well, number one, him turning it down, and number two, the offer? Yeah, it's the offer doesn't surprise me as much when you think about, you know, sure he was struggling a bit last year, but he still got pretty close to his numbers for the most part. And as a whole, he's been a great player in Coors Field, a staple of the team. I was surprised for the fact that they have so many um, outfielders right now, and that's always been something we've talked about since day one. And then the part that's funny is, A, they're not letting us know how much the actual number was. B, he's having a horrific season now. He is just so, so bad. Last year he had 25 homers and 100, and 100 RBIs. This year he's got a 298 OBP. These are just bad, bad things. And to make it worse, he's going to hit a free agent market with the likes of J.D. Martinez and Melky Cabrera and Carlos Gomez, given not the deepest market in the world. They're still outperforming. Well, maybe not Carlos Gomez, but he might. He actually is probably. They're all outperforming uh, Cargo. This is just um, – what one would say was like it's what Ian Desmond did a few years back, where he turned down the golden, the golden goose, and he made it work in the long run. But he was also a lot younger than Cargo, so I'm kind of curious how this turns out for him. He might make some contender or rebuilder, aka the Braves, very happy to get him at a discount. But um, he really missed his last big payday, I think. Yeah, I thought it was unfortunate that the Rockies didn't trade him after the 2015 season. I think they were trying. You know, he had that 40 home run. But in terms of fantasy, he was a 2020 guy for years, and he just all of a sudden stopped stealing bases altogether. A couple of of, uh, of nuggets, a couple of stats, you know, advanced stats that kind of jumped out at me in, in an article that was on Fangraphs. This year he's a minus, you know, whether you believe in war or not, minus 1.9 war. Um, which is, in my opinion, by far the worst because Pujols is minus 1.2 and he's a DH. So that's crazy. And then also in the exit velocity change, which which obviously has taken off from the last year or so, um, that stat and exit velocity altogether with StatCast, minus 4.2 exit velocity change from 16 to 17, which is also the worst in terms of a change. So, you know, you don't think of – you think of 29 to 31 as probably 28, 27 to 28 to 31, 32 is somebody's prime. If you didn't think he'd go this downhill this quickly, especially on, in his contract year at Coors Field, pretty crazy drop off for what was once a fantasy stud first round pick year after year. Yeah, it's pretty crazy, but uh, we'll stick with the Rockies here. And uh, like a feel-good story, and it turned out very, very good for the first time back. Uh, Chad Bettis of the Rockies, many probably know this story, know about it. Um, he was diagnosed with testicular cancer back in uh, November. He had surgery in December. They thought it was cleared up. When he was in the spring training, had one of his checkups. They found out the cancer had spread. So he had to start doing chemotherapy, which if most people that know cancer, chemo is the part that drains your entire body. The surgery is one thing. The, the chemo just kills you, and that's when it uh, it makes you wonder if he's ever going to come back. Well, he battled and battled and battled, and he finally got back to the Major League Mound not even that much later. It's crazy if it's in March and we're in July. That's just insane. Seven shutout innings of two Ks, no walks, six hits, 90 pitches. Of course, the Rockies and Coors Field couldn't – that's what makes it more present, Coors Field. Um, the Rockies couldn't score for him, so – they won the game. He got a no decision, but just overall the story is tremendous. He was one of their up and coming prospects at the t at a while back. Didn't really look like what people thought he'd be, but that also could be a prospect of hey, you pitch in Coors. But it's a great story. What's your thoughts on that, Mo? Yeah, I, I think I tweeted out on our handle um, the other day of him coming off the standing ovation. They showed his family, you know, hashtag you know, bet is strong, cancer sucks, all that kind of stuff. And then there was another video of Bud Black kind of just, you know, talking to him a little bit and then kind of staring at him, giving him a little pat on the head. And 
nice little moment there. You know, Bob, I, I don't know if people know this. I'm a crier. You know, I, I cry at movies. You know, I'm not a movie guy, but I'll cry. You know, Bruce Willis should have never done that. You should have let Affleck go blow up that thing in Armageddon. Should have never done that. I cried there, you know, should have never let that clown Affleck go and take care of it. Not him, but it is what it is. But no, seriously, um, you know, Tyon came back from testicular cancer a lot quicker, obviously. And it, I don't think oh. his was as serious as Bettis's. Um, so it's a great story, especially where Bettis had his daughter um, at, at sort of the same time that he was diagnosed. Go ahead. No, I just want to add on the Tyon part. As you mentioned, like the Bud Black story, I think Tyon reached out to him. Uh, yep. on social media and you saw a bunch of players do that and the intro when Bettis came to the mound they played the, like the comeback song so it was really cool what the Rockies did in the whole deal but yeah and, and by the way I'm I'm a crier also so no wonder yes. we get along so well yeah, nothing wrong real, with that. real real men cry so it's okay guys you're, you're okay um no but yeah seriously it was a great story like I said he's, he had his daughter at the same time you know his wife is you know he's dealing with cancer his wife's having the kid and they're dealing with having their first child, and now he's trying to beat cancer. You know, he beat it. Hopefully, it stays away. Um, and then they can just, you know, he can have more kids. He can pitch well. He, he can, you know, just live his life like we all want to live our lives. So it's yeah, it's a great story. Um, we get to a couple wa uh, waiver trades. Dave Bruce obviously made it through waivers. He had about four and a half million left over. Was traded to the Indians. Um, that kind of coincided with the Brantley injury. Zimmer really hasn't hit well lately. So they did need outfield help. Um, Jay Bruce is a great addition for them. A lot of power. He's had a great contract year for his stance. I know we talked about the beginning of the season. How he said, "I'm going to have a 50% fly ball rate." So he's hit a lot of dongs this year. I thought the interesting part, Bubba, was um, the Yankees were after him too, but didn't want to take the whole contract, um, but also didn't want to give up a, a, a better prospect to not do that. Whereas the Indians, who's obviously you know, they have a window too, but they gave up. They said, you know what, four and a half million, we'll take it. Um, what do you think about the fit for Jay Bruce in Cleveland? It's a great fit. Obviously, we would have liked him in the Bronx in that short fortune left. And it's kind of ironic of all teams, the Yankees don't want to put up $4 million. Um, but it's a great fit there. Like you said, it coincides with the Brantley deal. Adds more thump to a lineup that's already pretty potent. Uh, Zimmer's been falling off of late. I don't know if he got a hit yet today, but going into today, he hasn't had a hit in the month of August after being red hot in July. So they needed this boost to their team, and he definitely will add that. Um, four mil is not that much these days, and they gave up next to nothing because all you saw on Mets social media is they were furious that all they could get back was Ryder Ryan. And for all we know, he could be good. I don't know much about the kid. He's 22 years old. But um, I think it's a great deal for Cleveland. Yeah, well, I don't know what Mets fans are talking about. The rental prices, like we said, is not it's not high anymore. So you just can't – you can't be mad at what you get. I mean, you got rid of the salary, which we all know, you know, the Mets, the Mets owners uh, try to get rid of as much salary as possible with the issues they've had over the years. Exactly. Um, I'll take us to another, another waiver trade. The Milwaukee Brewers, they've been in – Rumors forever, you know, Ian Kinsler, all kinds of stuff to replace to, to play second base, basically, because Johnny VR hasn't been the guy they thought he'd be, and you don't really want to run Eric Sogard out there every day. So they went and traded for Neil Walker. They took all three million of his deal left, and it pretty much came down. We're going to give you a player to be named later type deal. wasn't too much to worry about, but what do you think about Neil Walker in Milwaukee? Good depth move for them. I mean, they're still in the race. Um, you know, they're one or two games back of, of Chicago that when the Red Sox took care of the Cardinals in a two game series, nice little walk off win. So that kind of helped him out as well. Um, and it looks like, I mean, he's been playing, played third base one game to give Shar a break. Um, and then VRs went to center field too. He played center field last game. So their council is going to mix and match them kind of everywhere. Um, you know, Broxton's back up. So he's going to kind of, mix and match that lineup a little bit and get Walker in as much as he can and try to keep VR in there. And obviously Shaw's playing every day because he's having a great year. So yeah, good trade for them. Definitely. Um, another move, which is funny to me, uh, our, our guy, Tyler Clifford, he's, uh, he got traded from the Yankees to 
the White Sox. And then the White Sox trade another bullpen guy. They've traded about 18 bullpen arms this, this season. Uh, and they trade him to the Astros. What the hell he's going to do for the Astros, I don't know. What the Astros are doing to that bullpen, I don't know. But what do you got on this deal? It's just another one of those moves that the Astros keep making us kind of scratch our heads because, you know, they, they've they actually been struggling. I believe they have one of the worst offenses of baseball in the last, like, three weeks. Their pitching hasn't been outstanding. They just got shut out by Patrick Corbin today. So, um, and nothing against Patrick Corbin. I'm just saying that's not what you expect from the Astros. Bright side is Clippard actually pitched really well with the White Sox. That's one of one positive of the deal. He kind of looks more like that wannabe closer people have kind of wanted from him in the past. But I guess they're, they're grasping at straws for something cheap because they went and good, got Liriano for crying out loud, and they gave up a good prospect for him to be in the bullpen, not even start. So now you go get Clippard. It's just one of those moves like, well, maybe it works, but at the same time, would anybody be surprised if it blew up in their face? And I'd like to point out, too, um, that the Red Sox are now four and a half back of Houston for the number one uh, seed in the AL, which you're going to want because you don't want to see Cleveland in the first round. Oh, no doubt about that. That's uh, I didn't realize they got that close already. That's 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 crazy. Um, they might want to – they're, they're going to regret, I think, not going and getting Sonny Gray or something like that. They really, really are. But on the bright side for them is – McCuller is starting his rehab, so maybe he'll be back in the next, you know, week or so, which they need badly. Badly. Um, let's talk about something. We talked about it at least a month ago, if not more. There's been rumors this deal's been done, then it's not, then it's done, then it's not. Different groups have gotten involved. Pitbull had a group. In the end, it's the group we all thought was going to buy the Miami Marlins. The deal is set in place. We're just waiting on the other 29 owners to approve it and a couple other, you know, dotting the I's and crossing the T things that I'm not even smart enough to figure out. Um, but what it comes down to is the group that Derek Jeter is a part of bought the Marlins for $1.2 billion. That's with a B that is ridiculous. Um, it makes you really wonder actually what the other teams in this league are actually worth. But uh, the really funny part is, is Jeter just put up a little, little part of it but he's going to be in charge of all the baseball operations. Apparently Michael Jordan's a part of the group. There's a bunch of people involved. I don't think it's quite like, you know, the Los Angeles Dodgers buying group, but it's interesting. Um, what's your take on that before I mention something else? Yeah. So it's Jeter, MJ, and, and a New York businessman, Bruce Sherman, who I didn't look up what he does, but I'm sure he does something big because he's going to be in the control. He's going to have probably the most money in it, or at least the him and his posse or his group. Um, Probably has a little significant more money than Mr. Worldwide. That's probably why this worked out for them. Um, he's a control person. Jeter's the business and the baseball side, as you said. As you said, we all thought this was going to happen, at least with Jeter involved. And we, you know, not that we don't know and we don't care about the rest of the people that were involved once Jed Bush was out of it because we don't know them. They're independent businessmen, so we don't we don't know them in the sense of baseball or in the sense of the world. I mean, we know, most of us know who Jeb Bush is. So, um, Jeter back in baseball, I think when we talked about it a, a month and a half, two months ago, he was putting up $20 million, which, like you said, is not, it's a lot of money. But in terms of his net worth and in terms of the amount of money that was put up to buy the Marlins is a lot. Now, I think, and actually, you go ahead and, and you go with what you were going to say next on it. Well, it, it, this, is more, this is more just on the, the kind of comical to me side of things. Um, you know, the reports come out, they're buying them. They're going to have to do some things. A non-comical issue is there's been the talks of Stanton getting traded have just gone crazy, especially with the runny zone, which we will talk about later. But he did clear waivers, everybody. So alert the media, the press, sirens, everything. He did clear waivers. That's been talked about many times. But um, – their number one priority in a lot of the reports is they want to get rid of the home run statue in the outfield, which makes me laugh that out of all things on that Marlins team to worry about is a statue. Hey, when you have a monstrosity, an ugly monstrosity out there at Marlins Park and you can put seats there that I don't know if you know, but that can be revenue for the team and make you money. 
um, you, you have to do it. So, um, no, but yeah, we'll, we'll leave the Stanton talk because I was going to bring that up too. So, no, as normal, great minds think alike. We'll save the Stanton talk um, for a couple minutes down the road here. Um, let's get to the AL MVP discussion. We mentioned it last week, kind of teased it, as you said. Mike Trout is back and he is raking. You have Trout, you have Judge, you have Altuve, and you have my guy, Chris Sale. There's a lot of articles out there on. He could win it again, even though he missed six weeks. Um, Sale could be the first pitcher. There's only been two in the last 30 years that have won the MVP, Verlander um, in 2011 and Eckersley in 92. Those were excellent seasons. Uh, what do you think about possibly Trout winning it, and who do you have winning it if the season ended today? Interesting. Um, about Trout, he just continues to – showcase why he's so amazing i'm not going to get into all these stats in the world you can look up you just google mike trout mvp chances and you see stuff everywhere just the fact that the guy can miss over a month of baseball and he's basically back up i think he's actually beating judge now to the, at this date and time in war he's basically his stats are better than they were in his mvp season um just everything about mike trout is amazing the one you know, thing that people point at, well, he doesn't steal anymore. That's because he's, he's, he's got banged up for one and B he's, it's just, you notice that with a lot of big power hitters, the speed leaves, the power goes up, they stay productive. That's just what happens. But what he's been able to do on a bad team, a team that we all both said were going to be horrific to start the year. And they are in the thick of the AO wildcard race. Like we talked about that they're not in the top top, but they have a shot, especially if, Houston keeps the struggle. It makes those matchups a little more winnable for the Angels. At this current moment, I give it to Jose Altuve. If Trout keeps doing what he's doing, I give it to Mike Trout at the end of the season. That's where I stand. Okay, this is going to seem bias and, and Homer-like by me. Chris Sale is the MVP this year. He is. Okay? I'm going to give you some stats. And I'm, I would like to compare them to the Verlander and the Eckersley and even the Pedro year 99 because he probably should have won that year too, okay? The Red Sox are 18-6 and six in his starts. He's 14-4 and four himself. His losses and the Red Sox – actually, the Red Sox losses were 2-1, 3-0, 3-2, 1-0, 4-1, 4-1. We get some run support here. We're talking they're going to be 24-0 and 0 in his starts. Now, you know – we could say that about every stat in the world and say, well, if you throw out this start, his ERA is this. You throw out this game, whatever. Um, he's gone seven innings plus in 18 of 24 starts. He has 10 plus Ks in 16 of 24. And the, and four of the eight that he didn't have 10 Ks, he had nine. Okay. Um, so I've got Chris Sale. He's got the highest war. Um, he's just absolutely – he's been the change. And, you know, maybe something happens. I know people have pointed to his – sort of breakdown at the end of the year for shoot for the White Sox. But I think before the season, I made this point that the, the articles came out. I think even White Sox, Dave and Barstool said this, that he kind of slowed it down in Chicago at the end when they weren't really in it to kind of preserve himself a little bit, you know, he brought the velocity down. So there were things here and there, but I have Chris Sale winning it. We all know I just said only two times in 30 years, the last 30 years in the AL, um, a pitcher has won it. I think this could be the year that he wins the Cy in the MVP, but we shall see. That's interesting. Um, that, that'll lead to a lot of the debates. Can a pitcher, should a pitcher win the, the, the MVP? And you name some guys that have. Pedro, if anybody should have won one, it should have been Pedro out of all of those guys. Ridiculous, yeah. It's insane. Um, yep. It'll be interesting because with the way the voting has changed, I mean, like by voting's changed, I mean the people voting are changing. They're getting younger, more current with things. I think it opens the door for more, you know, open thoughts on the subject. But um, as a whole – I just find it hard to give because he's going to get the Cy Young. I'm not saying he doesn't deserve the MVP. I just I'm just not a guy that's all in on that type deal. But we shall see. But if he if 
let's just say this. He's got 24 starts. They normally start pitches. He'll probably have another eight-ish. If they go – if they win 25 of his starts and win the AL East and it's more than a fourth of their wins in his starts, I know it's every five days, but, I mean, that's just stupid. Stupid. No, and, and, I, and I'm not arguing that part because what he does yeah. is he goes – almost eight plus, not even seven, like an ace goes seven. He goes eight plus almost every start. It's double digit Ks almost every time. What he's done is just remarkable. Yep. Uh, especially for a new club and, you know, a bigger media input city, all those things that people were kind of worried about with the guy that was tearing up jerseys in a locker room. Um, and you also have the circus known as David Price that he's got to be like, okay, we need to work together type deal. It's 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 impressive what he's done because without Chris Sale, you can even admit the Red Sox would not be obviously where they are right now. They might not even be sniffing a wild card last without place. Chris Sale because your other options were last bad. place. So, yeah, la- they're in last place without Chris Sale. Yeah, and that definitely says something to the MVP, and that's why I think if Trout keeps doing what he's doing, and the Angels at least you know say the final week of the season are still within range of a wild card, I think it's. It, I think that's more impressive because if you see what Trout has to work with compared to Sale, that's to me almost night and day difference. The only diff, the only argument, and I'll do, we'll end on this. The only argument I have against the Trout thing was we one of the episodes we mentioned the Angels without Trout, and they kind of were in the five. They were still five hundred without him. So I'm not saying that they're better without Trout. Obviously, they're not. But it wasn't to the point where they're 10 games under 500. Now they're five games since he came back. Yes, they're over 500 since he came back, but they were, you know, treading water while he was out. No, that's valid. Very valid. All right. Let's move on to a guy that's making an attempt at the National League MVP, but he plays on such a bad team that it'd be like A-Rod-esque to win this when he was with the Rangers. We're talking Giancarlo Stanton. It What he has gone through, it defies video games. It's amazing for the fact that I'm pretty confident enough to say he's clean. I really hope he is. Everything about him seems that way. The guy is just on a tear like no one I've ever seen, um, at least in the non-steroid era. Just real quick, he has 44 homers on the season. He has hit 11 in 12 games, 23 and 35. This was as of uh, yesterday, and they had the day off today. Uh, he's just 18 homers since the all-star break. The youngest or the uh, 12th player in history to reach 250 homers by the age 27. We've always said we wanted to see Giancarlo play a season without getting hurt. We're finally getting that. And it is absolutely insane. What are your thoughts on Stan? Oh, ridiculous. And I think we talk about it all the time with, you know, we mentioned fan graphs articles all the time. They came out with sort of his, in the last couple months and what he's done to change his stance. He's closed his stance significantly and now he's murdering the ball. I mean, it's not like he was still having a good season before, but like you said, I mean, 23 home runs in 35 games, he's got 12 in August and we're not, we still, we're only halfway through August. Um, so it is, it's just crazy. And now we can mention how he went through waivers he got through that contract is crazy. It is for the Marlins. He can opt out in 2020. They've talked about it all week on Boston radio, how this is our guy. We have to go get our Manny, our next Manny Ramirez. We have to go get this. Are we going to trade bets? Are we going to trade JBJ? Will the Yankees go after him? Will the Cubs go after him? All the big, big names. Will the Giants trade Christian Arroyo for him? You know, what, you know, it's like just kidding on that one, but seriously, it, I don't know whether they'll trade him. I don't know what ownership, what they'll think. Will they just, just start over? Because with that contract, Bob, I don't think that they'll get more than one stud prospect because they're just mainly trying to dump the contract. What, I mean, what's your thoughts on that? That's the biggest part that makes this difficult. He still has like I think 10 years. I'm just estimating from what I remember here, like 250 something million dollars. It's a massive deal in the per year amount. That is nothing compared to what some of these guys are going to get in the next couple of years. And for the caliber that Stanton is, that's great. But maybe five, six years from now is even close to this caliber. That's tough to tell. Um, 
it, it, it's just so much, and it really sucks for a fan base that's sitting there going, okay, we got Jeter's company in. We're going to have something now, and then you're going to trade our best player, and you're going to make sure someone else takes the contract so we get nothing in return, to, and we already have one of the worst farm systems in baseball. It's a trade that I do not like at all. Now, if you can trade him to a team – and you keep some of the salary and get a cup like a good prospect package. It's worth listening to. It's very that makes a ton more sense. But a lot of the deals like you're talking about, it's like okay, throw me one like mediocre talent, maybe a top, you know, a 15 to 30th guy on your team, and eat the salary, and we'll call it good. That is not good baseball. Yeah, a lot of. I mean, they're throwing out in Boston at least. I don't know. I'm sure the Yankee. Sure, New York radio is doing it. I'm sure the Cubs radio is doing it. You know, with saying throw, throw in Bogarts, throw in Jackie Bradley, throw in. I mean, they're like, well, now Devers. So it's it's craziness. I, I just don't, I don't know what the Marlins ownership will do. Obviously, they can afford it. They just paid 1.2 billion dollars, so they can afford it. But it that uh, that'll be something that we talk about in the off season as soon as one move is sort of made by them that will f- kind of figure out what direction they're going to head in here. Um, another streak, which is pretty insane. It's not as crazy. I think um, to I think a lot of people didn't know about this streak because the Giancarlo Stanton is always on TV and it's, and it's a homer. It's chicks, chicks take the long box sort of thing. Joey Votto had 20 straight games getting on base twice. He lost it last night. By, and he needed one more game to tie Ted Williams' streak, 69-year streak, nice. Uh, and he lost it last night. I mean, like I said, I don't think many fans know about this streak, uh, but what did you think about Joey Votto? It's one of the more impressive things you will ever see. It doesn't, like, you know, jump off the papers because, like you said, Stanton's on TV hitting bomb after bomb after bomb. So no one really pays attention to guys like Joey Votto. He's just a quiet guy that year in and year out is literally one of the best baseball players, but he's on the Reds, so no one cares. If he was in Boston or New York, even San Francisco, this guy would be getting so much love. His numbers, he's a career 313 hitter with a 427 OBP. He's got power for days. But a streak like that just goes to show you how disciplined he is. I was telling you before we recorded the way he lost it. He singles his first at bat, and then it was like his third or fourth at bat. He hits a laser up the middle that if Lackey doesn't have his glove in front of his face, decapitates him. And that would have been the streak. And then as we record on Thursday, he reached base twice yet again. So he that's been going on for 69 years. It, it, it's very, very, very impressive. I'm glad some people started to notice it because they started realizing how good he is. You saw during the streak the madman or mad scientist known as Joe Madden even put four outfielders in against him. So what's Joey Votto do? He hits it between them all and gets a double. Um, it, you just, he just couldn't be stopped, and he's that that good of a baseball player. He had an opposite field home run off of uh, Lester today. When the wind was blowing out to right, he hits it out to left. Very, very good, and it's a shame that, you know, they paid him a lot of money, so they haven't been able to trade him yet, but someone needs to take that on because he still has some good years left, and he can make a big impact somewhere. But, yeah, very, very cool little streak. Yeah, I didn't know he was almost 34 years old, to be honest with you. I just assumed that he was around, like, 31, and he's, he's locked up through 2023, and there's an option year, too. So that brings him to his, you know, his 40th year of his life, almost 40 40- first year of his life um i don't know whether it's even tradable i know i agree with you he has years left but i don't know if a team will take that on and maybe they will like maybe you know we need a first baseman so maybe the red sox do but they don't give anything up that's one of those things where the reds are in a tough place when they're rebuilding like the marlins um yeah but, uh, but one, one more thing yeah go ahead like like with him a trade piece for him, you send him to a Red Sox, a Yankees, where he can even DH once he slows down defensively because he's still a gold glove caliber defender. But that yeah. swing is not going to age. He could be – I know you can't replace Big Poppy in Boston, 
but he could be that kind of left-handed DH that just flips it over the monster 30 times a year, and he could do that in his 40s, no problem. Yeah, would love it. Would love it for sure. Um, gruesome injury and a big injury. We and we kind of held this one a little bit. But Bryce Harper to the DL. You, when you looked at that video and then looked at st- still shots, at least when I did, you would think that he his leg was going to be amputated with how crazy it bent compared to the rest of his body. So significant bone bruise, which is incredible. Maybe it's because of his leg strength. I don't know. You know, he does, he doesn't, you know, maybe he doesn't lift with his arms. He just lifts and he just does legs. It's only legs day for him at the gym. But crazy, crazy injury. And now they're calling. It was a wet day, folks. So he slipped on the base. Now they're calling to look at the bases, to change that up, make them, maybe make them flatter. What'd you think on the injury? And what'd you think about the talk after? We have like Buster Posey and, and, um, you know, um, Chase Utley talk here, changing rules. Well, first off, I'll make a joke about this before I get started. When he crossed the base and fell, it reminded me of like those soccer players that get shot to stop time or to just delay time. He, uh, he yeah. so bad. Oh, very but, topical. Uh, very topical because I like soccer. That's very topical. Nice, nice. Man. <laughs> well, the EPL just started, so I had to throw something out there. Um, but on the note of his injury, it looked bad. It reminded me. Obviously, it was more in his knee, not his ankle, but it was like when Jason Kendall snapped his ankle, when he went through the base and just his whole thing just collapsed. And it was bad. He got his head and shoulder commercial, though, because his hair was flowing through the whole thing. Um, The idea of – well, first, it sucks that they're going to lose him for at least four to six weeks. There's no official timetable. They have the East wrapped up, so you don't waste – don't even try to bring him back early. Don't go to New York Mets with Noah Syndergaard early. Bring him back game one of the playoffs for all you care. Um, The base thing is comical to me because I'm pretty sure there was 27 outs on both sides that day, plus guys getting on base, and one guy slipped. Um, I agree. It's like Posey and Utley. One thing finally happens that's happened forever, and they changed the rule. And since it's Harper, one of the quote-unquote faces of baseball – we're going to have to change things. But um, what are you going to do? Hire Cowboys like it's the NBA and come out and rub like every other pitch, wipe down each base? It's just not feasible to take care of this. I guess you can make a different materials, what they're talking about. It's it's funny to me that, that that's what they're worried about instead of, you know, if it's that bad and that unsafe, don't play the game. That's simple. Yeah, if it's, if it's Wilmer D, Defoe or, you know, Michael Taylor or Brian Goodwin or anyone else on the Nationals that isn't Bryce Harper or Daniel Murphy, we're not talking about changing the bases. So it's pretty crazy. Like I said, you know, the Buster Posey rule with running into to the catcher and then the Chase Utley rule with second base, you know, those that's one thing. But that's like, you know, those are concussions. Those are things where, where we're like leg breakers that you can avoid. This is just a fluke injury. And, and thank God that he's not hurt worse because – you know, I'm not saying the national C, you know, playoff hopes would be over, but it would be pretty damn close to over. Um, all right, sort of our last topic here, we talked about the Cardinals uh, last week a little bit with have they lost their way and whatnot. There was a stray cat uh, at the Cardinals game and came out of nowhere, running around. One of the security guards or something, our grounds crew, picked it up, tried to get it. It bit them. They got it out. A fan came and got it, said it was hers. So they interviewed her. She left, then lost the cat. Now they can't find the cat. Um, and then sort of in, in the Cardinals sort of cardinal way and the just the funny sort of Midwestern jokes, um, you know, hopefully the Cardinals can scratch and claw their way, quote, unquote, oh. back, to, back to first place in the NL Central. So. Thought that was a little funny ending from their press release about the, the stray cat, the rally cat, as they were going. What do you got on the Cardinals uh, rally cat, Bubba? And the rally cat thing, it's, just, it's funny because if that's what it takes to get you guys back in the game, not you guys, the Cardinals, back in the game, that's just funny to me. But baseball is one of the most superstitious games you'll ever see. So if that's what it takes, go get them. I'm surprised they haven't like put out – 
flyers at SPCA's in the neighborhood and stuff and, and tried to find a cat that at least looks like him, you know, like those movies you see where the kid loses the cat, finds another one, paints it or something. Um, you, you figured they'd do something, make some money off of this or it's pretty comical that a cat is your reasoning for coming back. And then just to top it off, they lost it. It's just, the whole thing's just funny to me. Um, that leads us into our interview. We're going to try to do this every week if we can uh, with a, a topic or whatever that's going on. So we did, we kept talking Cardinals. Like, like Mo mentioned, we talked about how they lost their way last week. The cat thing got us thinking some more. So we interviewed STL cup of Joe. You can find him on Twitter at STL cup of Joe used to write for SB nation for the Cardinals beat on that. So we got about 20 minutes or so talking all kinds of good stuff. So I uh, give a listen and we will be back shortly. And welcome back. That was a pretty solid interview there with uh, STL Cup of Joe. Again, thanks for him uh, joining us on that. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Mo, take us in to the ALDL news. Well, a lot of DL news. <coughs> Excuse me, in the AL. Um, you know, Escobar, and now I've lost my voice. Are you going to the DL? <coughs> I'm going to the DL right now. Um, Bubba, why don't you start with uh, NLDL news, and then we'll come back to me here. <laughs> All right. Um, a freakish one for those Atlanta Braves we were talking about earlier. Johan Camargo um, was actually playing really well, you know, early in the season, part-time guy, got full-time. He injured his uh, – he hyperextended his knee taking the field before a game, running out of the field. I guess they must have saw a black cat or something. I don't know. Bad luck. So Camargo's out for at least two weeks. It's already been a week, and he's really not putting a lot of weight on it yet, so they're not sure what they're going to get there. A big-time uh, injury to the Chicago Cubs, who have been playing much better, we've talked about since the break. Makes the Alex Avila deal that much more important. Avila's been playing great the last few days. Another home run on Thursday. But Wilson Contreras, he got pretty messed up. Big-time hamstring injury, and of course it happened when he was playing first base, going to field the ball, a fly ball. They got him out four to six weeks at least. They're saying it's really, really bad, and they need him because he was crushing the baseball. So that Avila deal looks like they they, they would have paid a lot more, basically. Uh, Brent Suter, the left-hander for the Brewers, young kid, is pitching pretty good. Had, you know, good starts here and there. 10-day deal with left rotator cuff strain. There is no timetable for him. There's no need to rush him back. He's, he's a helpful piece to their team, but he's not the end-all, be-all. And last but not least, uh, Joe Panic got put on the seven-day concussion deal. He'll be out for a little while. Another just awesome note to a great season for the Giants. See, we can audible here uh, on around the bases because sometimes you just you get a frog in your throat. You just can't talk. So now I'm back. Uh, ALDL news, and I'm going to need my voice because there's a ton of them. We'll get through them quick. Neil Escobar uh, to the deal with a rib injury. He's hopes to be back late August. Alda Ber Berto. Mejia, with an arm injury, hopes to throw this weekend, um, you know, whatever, for the Twins. Uh, Michael Brantley, we talked about him earlier with uh, the Jay Bruce trade to the DL with a sprained right ankle. They hope to have him back late August, but I don't think they're going to rush him. All oh, the Royals. I, I talked about the Royals many times. What are you doing? You shouldn't be doing this. Shouldn't be trying for the playoffs. Because Trevor Cahill is on the DL with a shoulder injury. Unknown return. And the, the other bullpen arms that they got have not pitched well either. That trade has been – just has not worked out for them. Um, this one sucks. You wonder whether he's going to stay healthy at all uh, for a full season. James Paxton uh, was pitching unbelievable for the Mariners who are trying to get in the wild card race or in the wild card race, trying to get to the wild card spot. Um, out with a pectoral injury, out probably three weeks, early September. He'll be back. Couple Yankee injuries, Masahiro Tanaka shoulder injury. Hopefully late August. Uh, the ginger, Clint Frazier, out with an oblique injury early September. Hopefully, CC Zabathia with the knee injury he's starting Saturday against the Red Sox. So I'm very excited about because he's been pitching awful lately. So I'm very excited about that. Tulowitzki, finally his year's over. I mean, what a talk about Carlos Gonzalez going downhill. Tulowitzki, what an awful year. Out with an ankle injury. He's out until next year. Should be ready for spring training. Russell Martin's out with an oblique late August. 
Brian McCann to the DL with a knee injury for the Astros. He hopes to be back right at the end of it, but, you know, again, not good to have a knee injury when you're a catcher. Um, Dustin Pedroia, this one's been weird. Uh, you know, it's luckily, you know, they traded for Nunez. Devers has been fine, so they've been able to kind of put Nunez at second and not miss a beat. But, I mean, John Farrell has talked about tendonitis and, our, you know, just a lot of different things being said about a Pedroia knee injury. So this could be lingering not only this year, but for the rest of his career, which is a scary thing to say uh, for our little guy, Dustin Pedroia, because, you know, we definitely, definitely need him, uh, you know, throughout the rest of his contract. And that is the ALDL news. Um, let's go. You got You got Yeah, you got something? Yeah. Um, while you're doing that, I was checking something on Twitter real quick. And um, it's an ALDL thing, but it's not going to the deals. What I wanted to say is, on game one today, Indians, Twins, Jose Ramirez got hit on the wrist and had to leave the game. And, like, the first – they said the x-rays are negative and he might even start game two, which I think is silly. But uh, anybody panicking over him, he's fine. Well, that's another huge, huge – because he's been awesome for the Indians. They can't lose him. Um, we'll go to the last segment, what to watch for. There's not – we're not going to cover a ton. And, again, you, you people are probably saying, well, it's all Boston all the time. Well, you know – Seems every weekend they schedule it perfectly where they play someone of significance. So I can't help you there, folks. They're playing the Yankees again this weekend. Again, I assume it's Sunday night baseball because it always is. Hopefully it's not a four-and-a-half-hour thing and I can stay up to watch it. Friday's Montgomery versus uh, Montgomery. And Sorry, give me one second here. I don't know why I typed Bundy. That makes no sense. <laughs> I yeah, should have brought that right now. Yeah, I, I was like, we traded for Dylan Bundy? That's great. Um, I don't know. So it's, it's Drew Pomeranz, Drew Pomeranz versus uh, Jordan Montgomery. Saturday is Sale versus CeCe Sabathia. Sunday is Fister versus Sonny Gray. So that Sunday night game. You guys get to see Doug Fister. I got to tell you, it's a sight to see. Enjoy that. Although, actually, he's pitched well lately. Um, what do you got in this in the, in the big rivalry um, where the Red Sox kind of have a four and a half game lead going into the weekend. Uh, it's it's pretty interesting. I'm going to give you guys Saturday Silver Sabathia. That's one you can notch up in your MVP column. Um, you. Montgomery Pomeranz is interesting because you don't know both pitchers. They they both either pitch really really well or they both just get destroyed. Don't know what you're going to get there. And then Sunday night baseball should actually be really good. I know. Everybody makes the Fister comments. Heck, with Gray and Fister, you can make Fifty Shades of Gray Fister comments if you really want to get crazy. Oh, oh, um, I said I didn't do it. I said you could, <laughs> uh, but uh, we're, not, we're not that show. Well, we could be. We're not. Um, Fister's actually been really good, or at least serviceable, like you're saying, yeah. of very serviceable. And Gray, he's been good, but he's not getting any love when he's on the mound with the Yankees. So uh, that could be the the make the make or breaker. If you take two out of three from the Yanks this weekend, nails not in the coffin, but you're like sizing up the holes to put them in. It, it's a it's a big big series. The Yankees need this bad. A sweep would be huge for the Yanks, but they need two out of three in a bad way. It's almost sort of like last weekend where we blew game one um, against um, against the Yankees, and then we came back and crushed Severino in game two, which was huge. If they could do that against Sale, which I just don't think it, it's going to happen because he's just been lights out. I mean, he was pissed after the Indian start, and you saw it against – it was that DFS night where if you rostered Sale and Kluber and went with the cheap bats, you won the world, um, which doesn't happen a ton. So he was just pissed, and I think he's still pissed. And, you know, like you said, they need to win two out of three, minimum minimum I mean that's you know you should say that but even maybe a sweep to get kind of back into it because uh you know the Red Sox are rolling right now absolutely rolling and and this could be the, the big series where I know Girardi I don't I don't like the way he manages period but um you're going to start to see them really rely on those big bullpen arms they picked up to like you know say a Montgomery get us five innings and then we'll work from there. You're not going to see him stretching guys out, and can we get one more? I think you're going to start seeing more of a postseason feel in a series like this, given, as you well know, and so does Rafael Devers, that Chapman is not the same. 
given you threw you threw a hundred and three mile an hour fastball, but it went a long, long way. Yeah, I, w- I I completely agree. Devers is just amazing. I will mention, although I don't think that they're going to come back and win it, I will mention um, so we can move up the Boston thing. Uh, Cleveland at Kansas City. Kansas City's only four games back there, so if they can take two out of three, if they can sweep, you're right back into it. Um, you know, Seattle and your uh, and your Rays are another kind of wild card. I just think all those teams, ball the Yankees, are garbage. So it's I don't really worry about them. But in terms of those, that those fan bases, because we are we are more than just a Boston Red Sox, San Francisco Giants podcast. For those fan bases, those are two big big series. And you know, again, the Rays. What when, when are you going to call up Honeywell? I'm, I'm very confused. Yeah, I uh, I have a buddy who it who is a Rays fan, and he was messaging me last night saying, "I really need a Rays win so bad." Or no, it was two nights ago when Snell was pitching, and it was a close game. I said, "Well, you'd have it already if Snell wasn't pitching and Honeywell was starting the night, but we can't do anything about that." But. Um, yeah, the Royals is a good call. If the Royals can take two out of three and say the Red Sox sweep the Yankees, it just that's how tight the, the the wild card is. And we almost might have to make a weekly segment, just like weekly week to week, and see how much it changes because it is it's insane. It's gonna be a fun you know month month and a half for that for sure. All right, that'll do it on episode twenty five of Around the Bases with Bubba and Mo. Mo, any final words? No final words. Have a great weekend, everybody. Yeah, get it in. Um, check us out on Twitter at Around Basis Pod. Until next week, we'll catch you guys later. See ya.